Here we go. Okay, so this lecture is really more appropriate for Tish Ab'av, for the ninth of Av, than it is for really the weeks leading up to Pesach. But this is where what we're up to in our sweep of Jewish history. We're looking at the Inquisition and its methods. And just a, a quick background. In 1381, the there was these there were these riots that broke out <clears throat> all over Spain, <clears throat> and they led to a mass conversion. And the church then had an interesting problem. It, it instead of dealing with infidels outside the church, it had to deal with heretics within the church. But in truth, I think there perhaps was even a another racist motive throughout all of this, and we'll actually look at that. But now you have massive numbers, not one or two converts here or there, which had happened before in other places in Europe. You had mass communities of converts who may or may not have uh, embraced um, uh, Judaism in secret while outwardly become it, pretending to be Catholic. The, re the reason I say may or may not is because Jewish scholars debate heavily how much Judaism was really embraced by the Muranos, the Conversos, the New Christians, whatever you want to call them. There's a there's a an enormous debate between the great scholars of this period about exactly how much Judaism there was. But be that as it may, about a hundred years after this massive conversion that happened in 1381. Ferdinand and Isabella essentially set up the Inquisition. And the Inquisition's job is to find the heretics. Now, of course, everybody's pretending to be Christian. Everybody's pretending to be good Christians. So how do you figure out who are the heretics? And so this is our investigation or try attempt to understand what was the Inquisition and what were its methods. This, by the way, is a, an etching of the um, of a an auto de fe, which was means an act of faith, which took place in Madrid in 1680. Now, the one thing you can tell from this is these the the Inquisition was as much a propaganda me mechanism as it was a a if you could even call it a juridical me mechanism. It, as much as it was an attempt to root out heretics, it was an attempt to be a spectacle, and they had enormous numbers of people watch as these would go on. The first question we're just going to deal with a little bit is why. <clears throat> and so one of the great scholars of the Inquisition is Ben Zion Netanyahu. Ben Zion Netanyahu is, of course, the father of, of uh, the Israeli Prime Minister <clears throat> um, Bibi Netanyahu, and he is also the father of fallen hero, Yoni Netanyahu. And he writes a number of books on this subject. He has one very thick book called The Origin of the Inquisition in Spain, another one which is called The Muranos of, of Spain. And he is a staunch believer that, in fact, there were very, very few Jew Christians who were practicing Judaism. He thinks that this was all invented, or largely invented. <clears throat> in fact, he believes that the Inquisition made better Jews than it found heretics. In other words, Jews, people who weren't going to adopt Judaism because of this persecution, they clung to it or ran to it more firmly. But his version of why is it that the, the Inquisition started, he says the forces calling for the Inquisition formed part of an anti Murano drive, propelled by arguments of three distinct kinds religious, social, economic, and racial. We've discussed social economic in previous episodes and how in both Spain and Portugal, we spoke mostly about Spain, that the Moranos rose very quickly to very high positions in Spanish society. They became advisors to the kings, they became advisors to the nobles, they became prominent bankers, prominent, fi prominent fin financiers, and there was a lot of jealousy that took place because the Jews often could be more trusted than people raised in the nobility because the Jews had less competing interests. And so Jews, aside from perhaps our natural abilities, 
they rose to very high rank in lots of places, including the church. And so there's a lot of jealousy that went on around that. We'll look at racial in the next couple of slides. And religious, uh, presumably, well, the, the history of Catholics in, in Spain was that they were very dogmatic about, about certain kinds of religious doctrine. And there had been massive uh, crusades leading up to this point. <clears throat> there had been holy wars. There, the Albigensian crusade preceded this. But what I want to focus on is some of the unique aspects here, because earlier religious uh, inquisitions had happened, and this is not particularly novel in terms of a religious inquisition. But what is novel is something which is going to remind us in the post-Holocaust generation of something which is very, very resonant, or I should say, uh, resonance the wrong word. It, it's it's scary. It's it's terror striking. And so limpi, limpienza de sangre, which means the purity of blood. On the right, you'll see that we have a, a document here. This is a Portuguese document of blood purity as late as 1806. People sought out to have to get a document that would demonstrate that they had not one drop of Jewish blood, which is really fascinating that we're, we're trying to, you know, uh, Ancestry.com can only give you that if you're, if you're completely incestuous, right? That, that the idea that you have not one drop of Jewish blood is, is a hard thing to achieve. And you see Cecil Roth, who is another one of the great historians of this time, just so you know, Cecil Roth is on the opposite spectrum from Netanyahu. Netanyahu thinks that there, were, there was barely a good Jew amongst all of the conversals. Cecil Roth sees them as heroes, as people who kept the faith, who struggled against massive anti-Semitism and Christian prejudice. Um, so um, the utmost prejudice prevailed against maintaining any connection with them. So they were forced to marry, in most cases, only amongst themselves. Translation, there was lots of, just because you converted doesn't mean you really got accepted into the church or certainly not socially. So it's hard for you to get a good shidduch, right? You could only get a good shidduch with another converso family. And children of mixed marriages would be designated in the inquisitional process, especially as being half new Christian. While a person with a grandparent of Jewish blood would be called quarter new Christian. Similarly, we find persons des described as having a part of the new Christian if they possessed a single traceable Jewish ancestor or as being more than one half new Christian if Jewish blood predominated. You know, where is the, uh, where is the great embrace of the, of the Catholic Church? Where is, the, where is this uh, um, great spirit of, of being welcomed into the church? Here you see the Jews discovered that you can get rid of the religion, but you can't get rid of the stain of being Jewish. That it becomes, and the reason this is, terror striking. The reason that this makes it, should make us shudder is because this is what, what we came to see in the Holocaust. Christian anti-Semitism begins with a sense of, of the Jewish rejection of, of, of the Christian Savior. And so the Jews were seen as murdering innocents, the Jews were seen as, as uh, enemies of, of the church, but on theological grounds for thousands of years. Ultimately, in the end, Nazi Germany they didn't care what religion you converted to. They didn't care where you daven or where you genuflected. What did they care? They cared about your genealogical makeup, right? If you were Jewish by genealogy, then you were being sent to the gas chambers. The Spanish Inquisition is just such an event. The Spanish Inquisition is an event which, which starts to prejudice against Jews even after they have become Christians. That it is the blood quanta, to borrow a, a sort of a modern term, that is going to be one of the, the great damning elements of this. And so when Netanyahu says that, that part of this was racial, this is what, is he, what he is referring to. 
Now, this is, by the way, also was noticed <clears throat> even by their contemporaries. Then Yitzhak Abravanel, um, who has an extra B.A. in his name, apologies on that. Then Yitzhak Abravanel, or Abarbanel, was one of the great rabbis of, of Christian Spain. And he is he flees Spain with the expulsion in 1492. He happened to be the ch chief tax collector. He was the, the finance minister to Ferdinand and Isabella. He was widely recognized as brilliant and, um, and perhaps one of the greatest Jewish statesmen um, in, the, in the history of, of Jewish people since maybe Nehemiah. There had been no Jew who had been higher placed in authority than, than Abarbanel. And what does he say? He is. This is. Uh, this comes in his commentary on Yechezkel. So buried deep in his um, commentary on Yechezkel, he writes: Even though they and their descendants will endeavor to be like complete Gentiles, meaning the the Moranos, the Conversos, they will be unable to achieve this aim, for the native peoples of the lands in which they live will always call them Jews, will mark them as Israelites against their will and falsely accuse them of Judaizing in secret, a crime for which they will be burnt by, the, by fire. Abarbanel, you know, he davened in the shul. And if somebody was secretly trying to get some matzah for Pesach, or somebody was, was uh, secretly looking for a lulav for Sukkot, or somebody was looking for a shofar on Rosh Hashanah, or who knows what, or, or a trip to the mikvah, the, it w the Abarbanel would have known. He was obviously very connected in the Jewish world. His, his assumption is, no, th there was not, a, there was not a, 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 a mezuzah amongst them, that these Jews were fully, em had fully embraced Christianity and were not practicing secret Judaism, but they could not wash their Judaism away. And the crime for them was simply in their lineage, and they were put to the fire for, uh, by false accusation. So again, he's going to tell us that this is a, um, this is, he's going to tell us that this is a purely racially motivated uh, episode. <clears throat> of course, we'll, one of the, I, I didn't put a slide on it. It seemed to me it was so obvious um, that maybe I should have had a slide, but I guess it's so obvious in the reading. Sometimes the things that are most obvious, you don't, you don't make a slide for. The inquisitors reaped the value of the entire estate of a burnt heretic. So the estate of the burnt, a burnt heretic would revert to the Inquisition and the Inquisitors. And so it's very hard to, um, to believe that, um, uh, that there were pure motives. I mean, clearly not, but racial motives are not racial motives. There's certainly an economic driver there that the Inquisition was was just desperate to be able to um, to reap uh, further funds. Okay. Now, by the way, any people can interrupt me with questions if they want. Um, it is harder for me to monitor the chat throughout. So, if if you do have questions, please shout them out. So, 1484, one of in one of the first Inquisitions by a. C Sedula of December the 10th, Ferdinand had ordered the magistrates to compel the rabbis and sacristans, those are, that's like Joseph Marciano, the, uh, the Gabayim of the synagogue, to tell the truth as to all who might be asked of them. And in Seville, we are told that pr a prominent Jew, Yehuda Ibn Verga, expatriated himself to avoid compliance with a similar demand. Translation, if you were a Jew in, in, um, in Seville or in, um, in, in Toledo, the Inquisition would come in to Shul on Shabbos morning and they would say to you, okay, you Jews, we know that you have some mishpacha or maybe distant cousins by now because it's already 100 years after the mass conversion. So maybe we've got some distant cousins and maybe they come to you and they ask, can, can I borrow a little bit of matzah? Maybe they want to come visit your sukkah. You know who the people are who are who are secretly Jewish. You Jews, we want 
we want you to come and we want you to tell us who who are the secret Jews, right? Knowing full well that the punishment here is to is to be burnt at the stake. And th- this is one of those things that that came with punishments. Not nothing that the Inquisition did came without the cudgel. Um, and we see here, and we'll, we'll come back to this at the end, a very prominent Jew who we've talked about before, Judah Ibn Verga. Judah Ibn Verga writes the, really our primary Jewish um, source on the inquisitions of Spain and Portugal. He ends up, he goes to Portugal, and he is forcibly converted in Portugal. Um, I think in 1497, he's forcibly converted in, in Portugal. He manages to escape, and he publishes in in the Ottoman Empire. He will publish his his account of what went on in in Spain to the Jews. He is certainly sympathetic to the the plight of the Jews. He is a champion of of the of the struggle, and he didn't want to have any part of of being an informer on his fellow Jews. We will see, though, that many other Jews felt very differently. But I'm going to ask you to stay tuned for that. Okay. Okay. Now, in one of our first um, act of the auto de fe, the act of faith, so the penitents were allowed to accumulate. And at the first auto de fe held in February 12, 1580, 1486, these amounted, these amounted to 750 both sexes comprising many of the principal citizens of persons of quality. So you're talking about the upper crust, right? People would, would rat out and they would inform on the upper crust. It took two years to go through all of the investigations. We'll see that that was actually part of the process. And the ceremony was painful and humiliated, bareheaded and barefooted, except that in consideration of the intense cold, they were allowed to wear souls, carrying unlighted candles and surrounded by a howling mob, which had gathered from all around the country. Remember, I said the part of the Inquisition is a propaganda machine. And what it's trying to do is terrorize people. And so it was important for them to have crowds. Right? They had to let people know that this was happening. And look at look at all these prominent Jews, barefoot, bareheaded, naked, barefoot, you know, being paraded through, through the town square. And they were marching the procession through the city to the cathedral, at the portal of which stood two priests who marked them on the forehead as they entered with the sign of the cross, saying, Receive of the sign of the, the sign of the cross, which you have denied and lost. So I, I put this description in because I thought it was important to talk about the public humiliation that was part of the, um, the Inquisition itself. Here's another example from 1481. This is, again, near Seville. Our center, where they found ample work to do, burning there 23 men and women besides the corpses and the bones of the numerous deceased heretics. I had to, I just couldn't leave this out. What they they wanted to be so intimidating that they went and they dug up people who were accused after they'd already died so they could burn their bones. When the pestilence diminished, they returned to Seville and resumed their work there with unrelaxing ardor. According to a contemporary, by the 4th of November, they had burned 298 persons and had condemned 79 to perpetual prison. Now, one of the things which is not in this particular quote is another interesting fact. They, they were so good at intimidating people that lots of people left and said, I'm not sticking around for this. They would even leave their entire fortunes to be able to get out of town. And they would, the Inquisition would then burn those people in effigy. Very often we see that, that they burnt more people in effigy than they burnt um, in person which means that lots of people really did flee from this, this inquisition. Um, okay, now, the person who perhaps is most associated with and is the, is the great uh, uh, 
force of terror in the um, in the Inquisition itself. Thomas de Torquemada. Um, Henry Charles Lee, who writes the, the history of the Inquisition in Spain, writes of Torquemada, he was the union of the spiritual and temporal swords, which was the ideal of all true churchmen. So, you know, he was, he was wielding two swords. And the holy offers covered the land, and no one was so hardy as not to tremble at its name. They created such a fear and panic. You know, I would, the only things that I can sort of imagine comparing it to is, you know, the great terror of Stalin, uh, you know, the cultural revolution of Mao Zedong, um, maybe McCarthyism in the United States. This idea that, you know, anyone can accuse on anyone, servants can accuse on their, on their masters. There is the, you know, at a certain point, <clears throat> bishops were exempt, but then they were not exempt. The there was not a station outside of Ferdinand and Isabella that could be that that was safe from the accusations of the Inquisition. Among other powers granted to Torquemada was that of modifying the rules of the Inquisition to adapt them to the requirements of Spain. The importance of this concession, it would be difficult to exaggerate as it rendered the institution virtually self-governing. We know that interest, institutions that are self-governing without any checks or balances are, are the most abusive. Thus, the Spanish Inquisition acquired a character of its own, distinguishing it from the moribund tribunals of the period in other lands. The men who fashioned it knew perfectly what they wanted, and in their hands, it assumed the shape in which it dominated the conscience of every man and was the object of terror to the whole population. Everybody was afraid of these guys. These, they were the SS, um, without question. The procedure. So first they would come into a town and they would offer an edict of faith. And he, at, during the edict of faith, the faithful were invited at pain of excommunication to denounce those persons who committed heretical actions. So it's a sin to keep quiet. If you, if you think that that somebody's actually being too Jewish, then, then, and you don't say something, then you are excommunicated, possibly even punished at the stake. Now, Cecil Roth tells us exactly what the things are that you could, how, what were the evidence you were looking for? So if they observed the Sabbath, what does that mean? Putting on clothes or fe festive clothes, clean and wash shirts and headdresses and arranging cleaning their houses on Friday afternoon right? All you have to do is be caught sweeping on Friday afternoon, and you're off to the Inquisition. And in the evening, lighting new candles with new tapers and torches earlier than other evenings of the week, cooking on the said Friday such as food as is required for, for Sabbath, keeping the Jew Jewish fast, not touching food the whole day until nightfall. You got to love this, especially the fast of Esther. Remember our last session, we talked about how Esther was the champion of the secret Jews because Esther herself was a secret Jew, right? And so, we, and we said it was safer to fast than do other practices because you're really just not doing anything. But at this point already in the Inquisition, all you had to do is not fast sometime. And they could say, you know, God forbid somebody has an upset stomach and doesn't eat, right? Oh, you're fasting. You must be Jewish. Asking pardon of one another in the Jewish manner, right? So if you ask forgiveness of people, right, for the younger to the elders, right, and placing your hands on the heads of the former, as, as you would do before Yom Kippur, right, and without signing, making the sign of the cross, that was, that was evidence enough, and certainly, uh, you know, not even eating unleavened bread would be another way to, to be exposed. So the evidence, uh, as you can see, could be, be scant, but who really needs evidence? And here now we come to the real rules of the Inquisition. All parties, witnesses, accusers, and the accused were sworn to give testimony in secret and to swear to keep their testimony secret to be punished on par with heresy itself. That means you go in and you, you tell the inquisitor what you know and you give testimony. And then when you leave, 
you're not allowed to tell anybody what you talk to the inquisitor about. So there's no way for the accused to know what the accusations against them are. They don't even know the line of questioning. They don't know the sorts of evidence. They know nothing. They're completely in the dark. <clears throat> in fact, the Pope tried to actually, at one point, um, establish, the Jews sort of paid off the Pope to, to try and establish real rules of evidence and real rights for the accused. <clears throat> And he, he actually wrote a papal bull to that effect, but Ferdinand and Isabella refused to publish it, and ultimately he backed down. And the Inquisition really only answered to the Pope, and maybe at certain point to the, to the king and queen, did not answer to any other authority, and everything was totally secret. It was even a serious offense for prisoners to communicate with one another. And not only that, when you met with your lawyer, actually I have that in the next slide, but I'll say it now. When you met with your lawyer, the inquisitor was present, right? Now imagine <clears throat> you're accused of a crime here, and let's just say it's a crime you did not commit. And when you're preparing with your lawyer, the prosecutor is sitting in the seat next to you, listening to everything you're saying to your defense attorney, right? This deck is so heavily stacked on the other side. Not only that, you could be imprisoned for up to 14 years, and you would have to pay the cost of your imprisonment which even if you were acquitted could ruin you. <clears throat> and Rabbi? Yes. Um, when you said now, you touched on it a little bit when you said about how the church tried to put something in, in, in there with regards just to the Jewish, to the Muranos or the Conversos. What was going on with like a political balance of all the money is going into their coffers. How does that stand with the political rulers, with, with Ferdinand and Isabella, or like in partnerships? And where's the Muslim population at the time? What's going on? Like, is, are they... There is virtually no Muslim population, and the Muslims have exactly the same problem. Like, you could be, you could, you could certainly be brought to the Inquisition for being a secret Muslim. I have not done, I, I'm, the truth of the matter is, uh, I wish I had the time to read everything on this subject, and I'm sure there's some good there's good material about there about secret Muslim communities. I'm really just woefully ignorant about them, but I think it's a great question. Um, number two is um, how the money went back to the crown. That is a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would imagine they 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 you know, they would be remiss if they weren't taking a little bit of the money um, in this case. But Ferdinand and Isabella were very religious people, specifically Isabella. So um, it could be that she felt that this was her religious obligation to do as well. But I apologize, that's not my, uh, I, I, I did not see um, the, too much about how the finances went back to the crown. Um, but both good questions. I hope to perhaps be able to answer them in the future. Okay. Um, so um, now the names of the accusers were suppressed. The original purpose of this was, well, if, you, if you're accusing against powerful people, you don't want those powerful people to intimidate your witnesses. So that's why you keep the names of the accusers secret. But ultimately, all Jude Judaizers, anybody who was part of the Converso community, could be seen as dangerous, and so they suppressed the names of all of the of the accusers. Uh, the accused had to scour their memories to surmise who harbored ill will against them and may have informed on them. Right, and as I said, the ag the lawyer is only allowed to speak to his client in the presence of the inquisitor. Now, even with all of this, the deck is very stacked, so it'd really be hard to get an acquittal. And there was one case where, where the inquisitors actually acquitted the Jews and Torquemada said, you need to have a retrial. And they were acquitted again at the retrial. And then Torquemada said, you guys didn't do your job. And then uh, finally they were, they were convicted. In other words, Torquemada did not accept any acquittals. It, the only thing you could get once you were accused was burnt at the stake or perhaps other forms of penance. But the Inquisition also wanted a significant amount of confessions. 
And so this is the famous torture chamber of the Inquisition. This is an artist depiction of that at circa 1786. The buildings where this happens, the palaces of the Inquisition, I gave you two continents. This, the one on the left is, is the palace of the Inquisition in Mexico City, that would have been New Spain. And the one on the right is Evora, Spain. So those are both the palaces of the Inquisition. Uh, I'm go the next thing we're going to read is an English account of the same. This is a description of what would happen. The first one we're, go we're going to see is the rope. So the scene of this diabolical cruelty is a dark underground vault. The prisoner upon his arrival there is immediately seized by a torturer who forthwith strips him whilst he is stripping and while under torture, the inquisitor strongly exhorts him to confess his guilt, yet neither to bear false witness against himself or others. In other words, this better be a good confession. I don't want any false testimony. We're going to rip your arms out of your sockets, out of their sockets, but you better say everything truthfully. And essentially, the first torture is that of the rope, which is performed in this man. The prisoner's hands are bound behind him and by means of a rope fastened to them and running through a pulley. He is raised up to the ceiling where having hung for some time with weights tied to his feet, he is left down almost to the ground with such sudden jerks as disjoints his arms and legs, whereby he is put to the most exquisite pain and is forced to cry out in a horrible manner. If the prisoner's strength holds out, they usually torture him in this manner for about an hour and if it does not force a confession from him to their liking, they have recourse to the next torture. So on the left, you have, by the way, this, this is the museum. That's a, a mannequin at the Museum of the Inquisition. And you can see the artist's depiction of it. Uh, the, the one from the Museum of the Inquisition looks to me a lot more like a gymnast. Uh, and the one at, from the artist's rendition, which is more of a contemporary version, seems much more painful. And you notice they put weights on there on their legs. Uh, you should know also that they found that it would be even more painful if they gave him a rest of four days in between. So sometimes they would do this and then come back four days later because it was even more painful then. Uh, the next slide is waterboarding. Uh, and you can see these are two contemporary depictions of, of what they would do. Uh, they would also put a cloth down your mouth, which I, I guess uh, stimulates the choking response more. I, you know, I, uh, this is not my, in rabbinical school, they don't teach us much about uh, about torture techniques. But then after they finished with the rope, they would move to the water. And then finally, after the water, they would come to, to um, the fire. And they would, they would, they would essentially um, um, put combustible matter on his foot, and then essentially bring him near fire, and then essentially cause immense burns. Um, trigger warning on the next couple slides. I, I really wanted to, I don't want this to be me reading for a long time, but it, to me, it, it's so important to sort of see the, the history made in real time. And what this is, this, what this document is, the Cecil Roth quotes this at, at great length. He says, this is a, this is from the inquisitional record. This is the conf this is the the inquisitor taking notes as they're torturing a woman. Um, uh, and so um, he says, Roth says many of the the inquisitional notes will also put in the screams and the shouts that happen in between the tortures. This one has less of that, but you, you get a sense of what a session sounded like. So forgive me, anybody can say, Rabbi, we've had enough and I'll stop. But I have a couple of these slides because you'll see, you'll see what's going on um, in, this, um, in these episodes. She was carried to the torture chamber and told to tell the truth. When she said she had nothing to say, she was ordered to be stripped and again admonished, but was silent. When stripped, she said, Senores, I have done all that is said of me, and I bear false witness against myself, for I do not want to see myself in such trouble. Please, God, I have done nothing. She was told not to bring false testimony against herself, but to tell the truth. The tying of the arms commenced. 
She said, I have told the truth. What, I, what have I to tell? She was told to tell the truth and replied, I have told the truth and I have nothing to tell. One cord was applied to the arm and twisted and she was admonished to tell the truth, but she said, but she had nothing to tell. Then she screamed and said, I have done all they say. Told to tell in detail what she had done, she replied, I have already told the truth. Then she screamed and said, tell me what you want, for I do not know what to say. She was told to tell what she had done, for she was tortured because she had not done so. And another turn of the cord was ordered. She cried, loosen me, senores, and tell me what I have to say. I do not know what I have done. O Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Another turn was given, and she said, Loosen me a little, that I may remember what I have to tell. I don't know what I have done. I did not eat pork, for it made me sick. I have done everything. Loosen me. I will tell the truth. Another turn of the cord was ordered. When she said, Loosen me, and I will tell the truth, I don't know what I have to tell. Loosen me. For God's sake, tell me what I have to say. I did it. I did it. They hurt me, Senor. Loosen me. Loosen me, and I will tell it. She was told to tell it and said, I don't know what I have to tell. You kind of get the picture, right? She's not saying anything. Um, and then now she screams, oh, my arms, my arms, which she repeated many times and went on. I don't remember. Tell me what I have to say. And they continue to tighten her, tighten her, tighten her. She doesn't know what to say. Now, after the, the, this torture of the arms, right, um, which only ends because the, the cord breaks, she was then ordered to be placed on the porto, the frame. I think this is the rack. She said, Senores, why will you not tell me what I have to say? In other words, she just won't tell give me the script, guys. I need to say it. She was originally accused of being Jewish because she didn't eat pork. Um, Senores, I've told you, I do not know for certain. I have said that I did all that the witnesses say, so release me. I do not know it. Oh, they are tearing me to pieces. I have said that I did it. Let me go. She was told to tell it. Senores, it does not help me to say that I did it. And I have admitted what I have done. So again, she's admitting, I did what, what they said I did, but that's not enough for the inquisitors. The, proto, the porto is, again, I think the rack. So, so she was admonished to tell the truth, um, and the gareths were ordered to be tightened. She said, Senor, do you not see how these people are killing me? Senor, I did it. For God's sake, let me go. She was told to tell it. Senor, remind me of what I did. I do not know. Senores, have mercy on me. Let me go, for God's sake. They have no pity on me. I did it. Take me from here. I will remember what I cannot hear. She was told to tell the truth or the cords would be tightened. She said, remember me of what, of what I have to say, for I do not know. I'm sorry, remind me of what I have to say, for I do not know it. I said that I did not know, did not want to eat it. I know only that I did not want to eat it. And she repeated many times. She was told to tell why she did not want to eat it. She said, for the reason that the witnesses say, I don't know how to tell it. Miserable that I am, I don't know how to tell it. I say, I did it, and my God, how can I tell it? Then she said that, as she did not do it, how could she tell it? They will not listen to me. Again, you see that going through the same, they don't, the, her confession is not detailed enough. And then they move on to, uh, to the waterboarding, and um, she was she was asked, "What law?" She said, "The law that the witnesses say." I declare it all, Senor. I don't remember what law it was. Oh, wretched was the mother that bore me. She was asked what the law, what was the law she meant, and what was the law she said the witnesses say. This was asked repeatedly, but she was silent. Last time she did not know. She was told to tell the truth or the garotes would be tightened, and she did not answer. Another turn was ordered in the garotes, and she was admonished to say what the law was. And then here, uh, um, um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to figure where they start the waterboarding. She said that she could not speak and that she was a sinner. And then the linen coca, or the funnel, was placed in her throat, and she said, take it away, I am strangling, and I am sick, in the stomach, a jar of water was then poured down, after which she was told to tell the truth. She clamored for confession, saying she was dying. She was told that the torture would be continued till she told the truth and was admonished to tell it. But though she was questioned repeatedly, she remained silent. Then the inquisitor, seeing her exhausted by the torture, ordered it to be suspended. And it was probably con continued a few days later because th 
their goal was not to kill people, but again, to get confessions. But what we see from this account is how they're, they, they're, how repetitive it was, how you didn't know what to say. You didn't know what kind of detail they wanted. You didn't know what you were accused of. You didn't know what they were looking for. And there's the inquisitors are groping in the dark. The person is groping in the dark. She's willing to say whatever they want her to say, but that's still not enough. So um, the next section of all of this is a little bit more about the relationship between the Jews and the Inquisition. In other words, we saw earlier that Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Verga fled from Seville to Portugal because he did not want to inform on his, his brothers and sisters. But I said that was not universally the case. And this... This evidence is brought most, um, uh, um, I guess, thoroughly by Ben Sion Netanyahu in his, in his in both of his books. But he the details are all in this book, the Moranos of Spain. And he first quotes Rabbi Yoel Ibn Shaib, and in his commentary on Tehillim. He talks about their unusual punishment, which is commensurate with their crime, right? We saw all those, what those tortures were. So this rabbi knows what those tortures are. And he's saying they got what they deserved. Their purpose was to escape the Jewish lot, the sufferings of the exile, to take part in the lives of nations among whom they settled, and therefore they segregated themselves from Israel. In other words, these people betrayed their faith. And, you know, God found a way to punish them. God will indeed separate them from all the tribes of Israel, just as smoke is separated from fire. And I don't think that reference to smoke and fire is at all random. He's certainly talking about the fires of the Inquisition. And he'll say, they wanted to escape the fire of Israel. They will be punished by the consuming fire. Just as smoke dip disappears into nothingness, they will be wiped out completely. What he means by wiped out completely is that... They will both be physically destroyed and spiritually destroyed, that they will have no share in the world to come. There will, there will be no uh, recovery for them, not in this world, not in the next world. Um, a Barbanel, who we met earlier, who generally is very, um, he, has, he, he is a defender generally of the, of the conversos of the Murano community. He says, one who does not believe in Hashem and walks amongst the Gentiles, the Gentiles will kill him. They are doing today in many places among the children of Edom, Rome. That is how rabbis refer to, um, to the Christians. Christianity, the Holy Roman Empire, the Pope, that's known as Edom, who are no longer part of our religion, and they will kill them when they confess their Christian impiety. These are the ones, the wicked will be shaken from the land, the treacherous will be uprooted, burnt like an unturned bread, lo bread loaf. In other words, he's saying that if you try to escape your Jewishness, ultimately, he's, he's, he's reading from Hosea, the prophet, then reading it both back into the times of Hosea, as an interpretation of what happens when you try to escape your Jewishness, and saying, I'm, I'm seeing this before my own eyes today, that my brothers and sisters tried to escape their Jewishness, and they were, they were punished for it nonetheless, and they are burnt like the unturned bread loaf. But, and so Netanyahu believes that there was tremendous animosity between the Jews and the new Christians, and he believes that that the these writings are evidence of the fact that many of the Jews had no compunction against informing on new Christians. The fact that Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Virga is unwilling to do that and leaves means that probably it was more complex than anybody is really. Uh, uh, any one of these scholars is is representing. They're probably all true. 
there are, and so I think it's a it's a very complex situation. Um, and there's a mixture of many different attitudes. There's both sympathies and animosities. It is very possible that Jews informed on Moranos to the Inquisition. It is also clear that there were people who were so horrified by it that they they left home and property in order to not have to do that. And, you know, uh, as with many things, we see we see that the distribution, the mix of, it's hard to say any one thing about the Jewish people because there are many things which happen and there are examples on both sides. What are some of the lessons that <clears throat> I like to take away from this? Well, I think, there are numerous. Number one is that um, as Jews, unfortunately, anti-Semitism is baked in deep, and it doesn't matter which church you attended. It doesn't matter how Christian you became. It doesn't matter how um, how uh, um, uh, how fully you embraced Christianity, you couldn't wash the Judaism away. And the anti-Semitism became rampant. And Jews suffered mightily. Another lesson to be taken out of this is, and this I think all of the scholars agree on, is that the brutality of the Inquisition actually entrenched the secret adoption of Judaism. That people were uh, were looking for any way to, to strike back, however secretly, however individually, against the powers of, of the Inquisition. And that Torquemada ended up making many good Jews. You know, it's, it's a very sad, um, it's a very sad commentary. It's a very sad historical lesson, but one which rings true over and over again, um, which is that the anti-Semites make the best Jews. Ju Judaism, passionate, um, uh, faith-filled Judaism, is threatened by emancipation. It's threatened by freedom. It is, you know, uh, Jonathan Leipzig is still here. He tells the story. I seem to remember he told the story of uh, what is the Tsar and Franz Josef or something. They got together and um, and you know the Tsar said, "Well, why do you give so much freedom to your Jews?" And Franz Josef said to uh, the Tsar, "Jonathan, you'll tell me if I'm you telling get the story. Rid of your, you, you get rid of your Jews your way, and I'll get rid of mine mine." Exactly, uh, and so and I'll, and I'll win. <laughs> right. So, so I, that's another lesson I think to be taken from these, from 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 this this story. Um, and a, a third lesson, unfortunately, is that this can also these kinds of scenarios can create bitter, bitter fights between Jews. Um, I neglected to mention, but I can save myself now. You know why would why would you know, Yol Ibn Shaul be so angry. What is, why is it that he's he's looking at these people suffering and torturing and being burnt at the stake and say, you deserve it? Because there are memories. If you remember from our first lectures, the Jewish Pope, uh, uh, not sorry, the Jewish Pope, the Jewish Bishop, um, uh, um, Paul Paul de Santa Fe or Paul Paul Borges was started as, as a... Um, as a Jew, he was a rabbi. He, we have Chuvot. We, he's quoted in the uh, in the um, um, in the Rivash. He's he's quoted as as you know one of the pious rabbis. And he turns around, and he he becomes an accuser and a prosecutor of the Jews. And there were numerous uh, Jews who who turned around and were part of the accusation and part of these disputations, and who wrote these these documents essentially trying to convert the Jews. And they were basically Jews who had converted, who then not only converted, but turned enemy and used their, their old co-religionists as cannon fodder 
for the church and secular authorities. And so there was this real sense of whose side are you on? And there was a, a, a residual anger. And so these things, they create enmity between, between different camps of the Jews. And so, you know, it, when times get tough, unfortunately, it doesn't mean that we always bond together. Sometimes we're, we're, we, we look for, for scapegoats, for enemies, for people who, who, who we have anger towards. And you can see that play, play out in many different areas of, of, of Jewish history. And so I, I, I don't have as much to tell you about how the Jews responded to this. But I felt that, you know, since we're, we're doing this sweep of Jewish history, we're trying to understand the Muranos, we're trying to understand the, the rabbinic responses. We're also, the one thing we're going to see, the next, our next big project in this, It'll happen probably happen after Pesach, but it's going to see well. How did you when when Jews went to Salonika, when they went to um, Morocco, when they went to Tunisia, when they went to um, to Amsterdam? How did the how did the Jewish communities receive these returning Jews? Were they considered Jewish? Were they not considered Jewish? That's going to be our next project. But in order to get there, I just felt that it was. It was necessary to talk a little bit about the the scarring nature of the uh, of the Inquisition, and to have a better idea of of what of of the brutality that the Jews were were under during this uh, during this period. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh,